my name is Brent. Uh, I'm going to talk about Expo. Um, Expo is an open source project. Uh, it's also a company built by all these wonderful people that you see here. You might recognize some of them. We want to help you focus on the essential complexity of the problem that your business solves. And to do this, we try to handle the accidental complexity that comes with building cross-platform apps. And as you all probably know, uh, there's a lot of that. So more concretely, we build tools and services to help you build, deploy, and quickly iterate on React apps for iOS, Android, and web from the same code base. The tools that we provide are the Expo Client, the CLI, the SDK, and Snack. The services are Build, Update, and Notify. The client is like a web browser for React Native apps. Uh, you can open projects that you're working on in the same way you can open a website. With the CLI, you can initialize projects, run a development server, and do common tasks like launch the project in the simulator and view the logs. It also helps you interact with some of the services. The CLI comes with a pleasant graphical interface, so you can open that up in a web browser if that's more your style. The SDK is a collection of plugins for React Native to expose the underlying native functionality. So things like the accelerometer or camera or SMS, uh, the SDK takes care of providing a uniform interface to these native features, and it's all typed with TypeScript. You can kind of think of it as an extended standard library for React Native. Snack is a web-based editor that lets you write na React Native code from the browser and see the changes live in an in-browser preview or in a simulator or uh, directly on your device even. You can save and share your work. Um, this is pretty invaluable for use cases like reporting a bug or sharing examples to teach different techniques. Uh, it's kind of like Code Sandbox or CodePen for React Native. You can embed your snacks on other websites, uh, like what we do here in our documentation. Um, notice as well that you can edit the code uh, directly on the page and see it update live inside of the preview. And this makes it easy to test different options that are listed in the API reference without actually having to leave the page or go anywhere. When you have Snack open in your web browser uh, and you're signed into your Expo account uh, and on your web browser and in the client app, it will just show up on the projects tab so you can quickly open it up on your device as well just while you're browsing the documentation. Very soon we're going to be launching support for previewing web projects within Snack as well. So you'll be able to see iOS, Android, and web all previewed within the browser. The build service takes the JavaScript code uh, that makes up your project, bundles it into a binary, uh, and then you can take that binary and submit it to the App Store or the Play Store. If you want, it'll also manage your Android Key Store and iOS certificates so you don't even need to know what those are or even think about them. The update service gives you over-the-air updates for your app JavaScript assets and some of the configuration. Uh, you can split up releases into different release channels so you can create staging production or different release environments. The notify service makes it dead simple to send push notifications. In fact, setting up push notifications uh, with a managed expo project is about as quick as is possible. Um, in the time it took me to say this, you could copy and paste 10 lines of code into a project and get push notifications working in the same way that you can see here on iOS and Android. So at a high level, there are two main ways to use the tools and services to build your app. Uh, we call these workflows. So the, first, uh, the two first class workflows that we support are called the uh, managed workflow and the bare workflow. In the managed workflow, you just write JavaScript and we manage the rest for you. So let's go through what it might look like to build an app with the managed workflow. First, you might initialize the project with Expo init, run the server with Expo start, open the project in the client app, uh, use the community standard libraries like React Native Maps or SVG, uh, along with things like the things that are included in the Ex Expo SDK to expose the underlying native features. Uh, you can configure your project inside of app.json, publish and share your app with Expo Publish or Export, and build it with Expo Build, iOS, Android. Finally, you can deploy your app using Expo Upload and update over the air with Publish 
and uh, send push notifications using the APIs that are part of the SDK as well as uh, SDKs for whatever language you're using on the back end. So let's start out with initializing a project. Exponent gives you several options for templates, including a TypeScript template and one with React Navigation installed and some basic navigation stuff set up. After that, we just run yarn start in the project, which delegates to expo start for us. Then we open it in the client app. To run the app, we don't need to build any native code because it runs in the client, which is pre-built. And the CLI will automatically install it for us in the iOS simulator or on any connected iOS or Android devices, uh, or sorry, Android devices only. Uh, you would need to, if you want to get it on your iOS device, download it from the App Store. Uh, once it's running, anyone in the world with the Expo client can open the app if you share a tunnel URL with them. So now we need to build something. Let's make a React Native version of Sindrasaurus's uh, open source iOS app called Blear. It's an app for creating vibrant, blurred images from photos on your phone, uh, like this one that I use on my home screen. So we can scroll through the Expo documentation and try to find packages that provide the capabilities that we need. If we know right away that the Expo SDK doesn't have the necessary native APIs built in, then we should probably eject or just reinitialize with the bare workflow, which we'll talk about later. For this app, uh, we can have a look and see we need the image picker, we need permissions, we need some way to apply this effect to the image, and we need media library access to save uh, images to an album. So we have to start somewhere, so let's start with image picker. There's a runnable example of it on the docs page, so let's just uh, copy that over. Uh, but before we paste it in, um, I'll install all of the dependencies using expo install. Expo install is a wrapper around NPM and Yarn to ensure that the version of the package you're installing is compatible with your app. So now we can paste the code in and reload and, and it'll work. Next, we can build out the uh, UI just using action sheet and slider and uh, core React Native primitives. For the icons, I used Expo Vector Icons, which is a slightly modified version of React Native Vector Icons. Next, I'll install ExpoGL to leverage WebGL to create the blur effect. Then I'll install React Native ViewShot, Expo File System, and Expo Media Library to capture the result and save it to an album. So with those installed, all you have to do is some good old-fashioned programming and you can create this. Uh, and so this works now on iOS and Android. Uh, we can try running it on web, but it won't quite work out of the box. Uh, you can see the slider is just this little red dot. Um, so let's just take a simpler approach on the web. Um, we can make a page more like the one that we saw for the real Blear app that just has a link to the store and some source code. Um, but if you want to make the actual app work, uh, the source is available, and so you can uh, give it a go as an exercise. So in a managed app, we don't have access to the iOS and Android native projects directly, uh, so we can't poke around and modify the different configuration. So when we want to change configuration like the icon or the splash screen, we have to use AppJSON for that. Uh, if you want to build an animation from the splash screen, uh, then you'll need to do that part programmatically, but you'll still want to provide a splash screen in AppJSON because it'll be displayed before the JavaScript for your app loads. To share the app with teammates, we can run Expo Publish, and we'll build the bundle and upload it and the assets to our CDN. You may have noticed as well that when we ran Publish, the CLI warned us about uh, optimizing assets, so we can run Expo Optimize, and this will just use Sharp to attempt to uh, reduce the size of our assets by just applying some compression. If it doesn't make the assets smaller, it just skips them. If it is capable of making them smaller, then it does that. So we saved a couple megabytes on a few images. That's pretty good. Um, so now we could share the app. Uh, so when we publish, we got this URL where if you have the Expo client, you can open it on your device. Um, however, on iOS, due to app store restrictions, uh, you can only open projects that are built by you and your team unless you do something called a custom ad hoc build. So this is something we recently built. Um, so you can create a custom ad hoc build of the client by running Expo Client iOS. This requires that you have a paid Apple developer account. Um, but once you actually uh, run a build, you can actually give other people access to it who don't have a paid developer account. 
They just have to go to a link that uh, registers their device UUID with the ad hoc profile, and then they can install it directly. And so what that would look like when uh, it's ready to install is something like this. Um, so this version of the client is unlocked to open any project. And it also has some other capabilities that we can't include in the App Store version of the client because of the restrictions, some of those being background uh, geolocation support and background audio. And there will be more things in the future that we, we also can't ship to the App Store. So now that the app is tested and ready for production, or at least ready for a broader set of testers, um, let's go ahead and build a binary. So when we run expo build iOS, it looks like we forgot to provide a bundle identifier. So that's a pretty easy fix. We just follow the instruction. Again, go to app.json, add it under the iOS key, and set the bundle identifier. Now when we run it again, it will kick off a build, and we can enter our developer credentials, and then just hit enter a couple of times so that uh, Expo will just handle the distribution certificate, push key, provisioning profile. And you don't have to think about that. Of course, you can still get it at any time by going through your Apple developer account. Uh, it's just managed uh, in, in this way for you. Um, you can also just upload your version of, of these things as well if you maybe have an existing app that you are starting to build with the uh, managed workflow and using the service. You can upload all of these things so that we're able to use them in the build process. Uh, now you can use the application loader to upload the app, but I find it's a little bit easier to just run Expo Upload iOS. Uh, this uses Fastlane to upload the app to App Store Connect. And now that it's uploaded, you can add the metadata and all that kind of thing and push it through test flight for review. Android builds follow a very similar process, but we're just going to restrict the permissions to the ones that we need here. And we'll build an Android app bundle because we want to take advantage of uh, being able to include different architectures and split that out into a more lean uh, binary size. Um, but if you do want to uh, test your build locally, then you can leave out the app bundle flag and build an APK and just install it directly on your device or simulator. To point to the Play Store, uh, as you're probably all familiar, requires that you first create an entry uh, in the Play Store, uh, the Play Console, rather. Uh, but once you've done that, you can run Expo Upload Android, and it'll upload the build for you. Uh, it'll just download and, and upload the most recent build that you've done to Android. So now we just need to do the usual clicking and whatever you need to do in the console, and you can get uh, these builds ready to share with people. Uh, in the meantime, of course, you can continue sharing updates just through the Expo client and using Publish. Um, we can run Expo Build Web to build the web version and uh, share the links to our app. Um, you can deploy it to any hosting provider that you like. I just deployed it using uh, Zeit's Now service and then aliased it to bleer.bront.xyz. Uh, it's worth noting that even without thinking about it, this little website got a pretty good score on Lighthouse. Um, if I fixed a couple of things with those links, then it would be much better on accessibility, but I did this in about two minutes. so. So once your app is out for testing or on the stores, you probably don't want to have to repeat that process again uh, very often or ideally as infrequently as possible. Um, so in this case, I noticed that I wasn't asking for camera roll, roll permissions before uh, trying to save the file. So if you tried to save a file before opening the camera roll to pick a file, um, then it wouldn't work. So to ship an update, we just make the change and then run Expo Publish. Um, However, I did build the Android binary, you might have noticed, pointing to a different release channel. So it was pointing to the Android release channel. So I'm going to publish to that one as well. And that just allows us to release separately to iOS and Android if we want to. There are a lot of different ways you can separate release channels. That's just one that I did here. If you don't configure them, the updates will download synchronously on startup and then apply uh, the next time you start the app, or rather apply immediately. Uh, but if it falls back, uh, to the cached version due to timeout in downloading, then it'll apply the next time you restart the app. I usually recommend, though, setting this to zero, the fallback to cache timeout, so that it will always download asynchronously and then apply when you restart the app. But you can also just uh, manually do it as well. Um, so just change check automatically and then 
uh, instead uh, go ahead and use the programmatic API to check for updates and restart whenever you need to. So the build service and the update service default to the easiest out of the box experience, but sometimes you need to have more control than that. So it's common for organizations to have policies where their apps uh, need to be hosted in a certain place or cannot be hosted in certain places. Um, for example, Valve uses Expo for the Steam chat app and their policies require that they host their own app bundles and assets. And so in order to do that, uh, they can run Expo export uh, to create the JavaScript bundle and other artifacts associated with the release. Then they upload it wherever they like. Um, when they run Expo build later, they just point it to wherever they uploaded the release and it will build against that release. Uh, if you want to run the native build on your own machine or on your own CI server, the build service is actually just an open source tool and we have guides for uh, helping you set it up on Circle CI and other popular CI services. So you don't actually need to uh, use our services directly if you'd rather just use the tools in your own infrastructure. So with the managed workflow, you don't really need to know a lot about native code or configuration. You're just writing React code. Um, React Native version updates are also relatively easy. You have a third of the surface area to cover in updates, and all of your uh, native dependencies are updated and guaranteed to be compatible by Expo because we update them ourselves for everybody. Um, Christoph Magera wanted me to emphasize how easy the updates are. Um, I had to paraphrase him in the last sentence because he used some more harsh language about updating. Um, but I'm sure you could fill, fill it in with whatever you feel when you do a large update in an app that has something like 15 to 20 dependencies on it, which is, is fairly normal for a lot of good-sized React Native apps. Of course, there are some trade-offs. Most notably, you can't add your own custom native code. Uh, that's a showstopper for a lot of people. Um, you also can't remove native code that you don't use from the runtime. So the base size of an Android app is about 13 megabytes, iOS roughly about 20. Uh, finally, when you get to ejecting, uh, if you do need to do that, there's a pretty sh sharp uh, increase in complexity in your app. It's kind of a cliff, um, and you kind of need to handle all the stuff that you wanted to avoid in the first place. So in order to mitigate some of these things, we're of course going to continue expanding and improving on the SDK, uh, so there's less reason that you would need to leave the managed workflow. Um, we're gonna work on, uh, we actually have this for Android already in, in testing and working on it uh, soon after that for iOS, the ability to opt out of APIs in the build process so that rather than having a base size of 13 megabytes for a, an Android app, you could have a base size of you know, five or six megabytes or something like that. Uh, because you only include the APIs that you use. Um, now, we can talk later about some of the trade-offs that come with that, but uh, it's just worth, worth noting. Um, another thing that is a little bit further away, but we are also planning on working on, is um, custom modules. So you could add your own uh, native plugins in ad hoc builds and in standalone apps. And so you'd have basically your own kind of like white-labeled Expo client with your own kind of native dependencies and runtime inside of it. Uh, lastly, if we make the bear workflow more similar to the managed workflow, then the complexity that's introduced by ejecting hopefully becomes more of a speed bump and less of a cliff. So that's kind of the perfect segue to the bear workflow. Um, the bear workflow is, is just how we think about using Expo tools and services in a typical React Native app. So what probably a lot of people here are, are, are doing, but with some Expo stuff uh, being used alongside it. So if you have an existing React Native project, you can just install React Native unimodules, um, or you can initialize a bare project with Expo init. Uh, if you have an existing managed project, you can eject to a bare project starting from the next release, which is SDK 34 coming sometime week-ish or so. Um, and now, basically, you can just use any native code you want, of course, as we're all familiar with. Um, but you can also continue to use the Expo client to share uh, parts of your work if you, if you want to. Um, you can continue also to use Expo for web if you like. Everything else though is, is up to you. So installing it in a project with React Native CLI or React Ignite CLI or, or whatever you use to create it, it's just a matter of installing this React Native unimodules package. Uh, 
I sped it up here. It would probably take you a few minutes. The instructions are all in the readme. Um, it's a lot easier, though, if you have a new project, you just initialize it from scratch, and it'll include all of that stuff for you. Um, as for ejecting from an existing managed project, um, it's just a matter of running eject. Um, so when we launch support for ejecting to bear projects, it's going to be the first big step to replacing our old version of ejecting, which was called, uh, people refer to it as detach or expo kit. Um, it was really monolithic and prescriptive, and it was problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, you can learn more about why we're changing that in the blog. Uh, the most important guiding principle for us here is that when you eject, you should end up with the same project you would have started with, or you would have ended up with if you started from scratch using you know, any, any other React Native bootstrapping tool. Um, this way, you can start off with the managed workflow, and if you end up ejecting, there'll basically be zero cost. You'll have just saved yourself the time that you would have otherwise spent uh, doing other things earlier on. To add a library from the Expo SDK, we just install it through NPM and then run pod install to, uh, and then we recompile our projects. Uh, this is the same thing as React Native's upstream auto linking, which was actually inspired by the Expo implementation. Uh, we've had that there for a number of months now. Um, in terms of adding other libraries, uh, it's just the same as you would do in other React Native apps. So uh, here I'm just adding React Native Mapbox GL to an app that I ejected, which was just the Chain React app that I converted to use the managed workflow originally. And we can see now that we've got the Mapbox view there. Um, so you can continue using the Expo client, as I mentioned, uh, after you've added this native code. You just need to add some guards to prevent the native APIs from being invoked when they aren't available. Um, so we've, we've found that some developers have needed to eject, but, but they want to continue using the client for day-to-day -day development or for sharing builds. Um, so we decided that we were going to explicitly support it. Uh, one neat thing that this enables is that you can set up a tool like Apper uh, from Formidable Labs, and, and it will automatically deploy uh, a build on each pull request, and then you can just scan a QR code and open it. So as long as you're careful about uh, adding guards around the native dependencies that aren't supported, you can use uh, the client to test out apps really easily uh, in each pull request. Uh, Expo for web as well continues to work the same in their projects. Here I just uh, imported one of the components into a plain app.web.js. Uh, like we've already seen, it's most likely that your app won't just work out of the box using uh, React Native Web or Expo Web, which is just is more about that, but it's React Native Web with some stuff. Um, uh, but we're working towards getting it there where it, it can be ideally as, as close as possible as getting it just working out of the box. So using the Expo tools in a vanilla standard React Native app can be pretty useful, um, but compared to the managed workflow, you're really accepting a lot more complexity. Uh, in its current form, the bare workflows allows you to use the SDK, to some extent the client, the CLI, and Snack, but not any of the services. So this is a pretty good start, but it's not where we want to be. Um, in terms of mitigating the trade-offs, uh, we think that by bringing the bare workflow closer to the managed workflow, uh, we hope to decrease the kind of sudden cl cliff of complexity that you encounter when you eject and make it yeah, a, little, a little more tolerable. Um, as the SDK grows and improves, as we are mentioning before, um, there will be less dependencies that you need to have on, uh, you know, random third-party libraries that are, uh, you know, maybe sporadically maintained, and uh, you'll be able to use more of the Expo SDK for your app and therefore have hopefully easier updates in any React Native app. Uh, we're also exploring applying app JSON configuration to projects, so this could be a way where rather than having to learn about how to configure things uh, uh, in, in the native way, you could just make the change that we saw to app.json and then apply it and it should update your projects. So Expo is an open source project and it's a company. Uh, it's a universal React development platform um, that can handle the accidental complexity of building and deploying apps to these platforms and maybe more platforms in the future. Uh, today we're launching our first paid plan called the Priority Plan. It adds support for teams and for some dedicated build infrastructure. 
So teams uh, allow you to collaborate on the same app from different accounts, so uh, different people on your team can publish and roll back and whatever, and you don't have to be sharing credentials between people, and they can also uh, give access to people to view the app from the iOS version, uh, the App Store client. Um, in addition to that, the dedicated build infrastructure means that your builds that you run through the build service never have to sit in a queue. Uh, you run the build and it'll be processed uh, essentially immediately or as close to immediately as possible. Um, coming up, we have private snacks. We've had people asking for this for a while. A lot of people will use Snack internally at their larger companies to create prototypes and share things around and they don't want this kind of thing to be public, so we're gonna be adding support for you to make private snacks and just share them with people on your team. Um, some better integration of the services into CI, uh, optional modules, which I mentioned before, and custom modules. That said, the community plan, so everything people have been using so far, uh, remains free, and our services will uh, continue to be able to be operated on your own infrastructure, so it's just a matter of if you want the convenience and, uh, and these capabilities just out of the box without the headache of maintaining your infrastructure and, and whatnot, then uh, this could be a good option for you. Uh, so that's about it. Um, just want to mention that coming up quite a ways away from now, uh, next April, AppJS Conf is a conference that we do with Software Mansion in Krakow, Poland. There are a few people who are here that I saw there uh, last April. It was really fun, so I encourage you to check it out, and we'll talk more about Expo there as well and, and just React Native in general. Thank you.